podcast. Life is a hideous thing. We'd all like to think we'd know ourselves, our family, our friends. The world around us is built the way we want it, tailor-made to our needs, wants and tastes. Life is a warm, cuddly journey, pretty much mapped out before us. The Art of War by Sun Tzu teaches us only to know thy enemy. And when this is applied to business, the art of deception is paramount to success. The only rule? Show me the money. 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 I'd like to welcome Ryan Brown to Life is a Hideous Thing podcast. Uh, welcome, Ryan. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing well. How are yeah, you? Yeah, I'm well. Yeah. I don't know why I'm feeling shit these days. I, every day I seem to get more tired quickly yeah. and just feel run down. And I'm, I'm not doing a very uh, taxing job at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what that is? That's old age. <laughs> That's what it is. I'll tell you. Over like the last two years, I've probably aged about 10 years. The less sort of running about and stuff you do and the more sitting down and sort of working at a computer, you know, it just kind of, it just sort of, it takes it out of you, you know. So do you, do you think computers are having a, a negative effect on the way we grew up? I mean, we would have been out running around in the street throwing bricks through people's windows. Well, I, I still do that, you know, I still <laughs> throw bricks through people's windows, but um, I don't want to admit anything right now, you know, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. I do, actually. I think that um, computers generally, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sitting down and with TVs and everything, you you basically go from the TV to the the computer. It's all sort of sedimentary and it's just not, it's not a great way to, to work. Your body needs movement, get okay. rid of all the toxins and everything else. And, you know, you have to balance it out. Well, there's no way I'm going to the gym. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well... You don't need to. You can run up and down your stairs. You know, it may be a bit strange, like, you know, if anybody lives next door to you and stuff and hears this noise, you know, if you can up and down the stairs. But it sort of does the same thing, doesn't it? You know, well, it's exercise, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really weird because, like, you've got this place, you know, where you go for the gym. But, I mean, you can do, you could do all your housework. You could run up and down. You know, you could do all the stuff you need to do at home. Like, I mean, I'm sure that's a lot of it. Plenty of exercise, actually. I actually can agree with that because I had some visitors come over a few weeks ago and I thought, I better tidy up the house, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was fucking knackered after that. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it, I'll tell you. Yeah. I was like, as they say, pooped. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, get a couple of people coming around, you know, more regularly or whatever, and you're sorted, you know what I mean? Muscles upon muscles then. So you're from, you're from Belfast? Yeah. You're born, yeah. born and bred in Belfast? course yeah yeah because mm-hmm. i have i have played a show there with a band uh, i was in before cradle yeah mm-hmm. and um we i think we played in belfast and then i can't remember it was it was maybe 15 years ago where we went i, I guess we crossed the border into um another part of ireland okay maybe, into the south yeah yeah maybe mm-hmm. to play dublin is that is that right yeah 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 mm-hmm. and I, I remember this very v- weird sort of image of a really like a border and it was like big yeah. gu- guard towers with barbed wire and like people standing yeah. around with yeah. guns and i was like dude yeah. we kind of <laughs> we kind of see that on the telly and think yeah whatever yeah. and then when you see it for real it's like holy shit this is fucking weird <laughs> yeah 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 is all that, that sort of, i mean that was normal yeah that, that was normal then and um it slowly disappeared a lot yeah. of that slowly disappeared but it's sort of everybody's grown up around that type of thing and yeah. um 
it's still sort of in the back of your head. You know, there's still there is still borders in your in the back of your head for a lot of people. It'll take a long time for things to completely change, you know. But um, it is changing. But it is changing, yeah. Which which is really good. Like it used to be really crazy. And you've just been to England, haven't you? You've just been to Bristol. Yeah, uh, um, log lawgiver too. Yes. How was that? Because I didn't even know that was, was a convention. Um, well, that's that's their second convention. This year was bigger than last year, and um, I, I wasn't at last year, but it was really, really good. A lot of sort of dedicated Judge Dread fans and a lot of cosplay sort of Dread type people. You know, it, it was just, it was really, really good, really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of new to. Uh, I've, obviously, I've read comics all my life, but I've not. Mm-hmm. There was this big gap where I was yeah. more more of a musician than a, a yeah, anything, yeah, yeah. anything else, and um, I don't know. I, I seem to have lost track with a lot of stuff, and a lot of stuff's gone on. And just just only an yeah. hour ago, I was doing a bit of research into sort of comic coloring. I just realised that I'd opened a real can of worms because I didn't know fuck all about the artists, <laughs> <laughs> and there were so many like brilliant ones. I was like, holy shit, man! I'm, oh, just yeah. don't even look right now because yeah. I I start to get a bit nervous that I'm way out of my depth in a lot of what I talk about. Yeah. Well, um, same same as me. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's there is so much. You you just chip away at it. You know. Yeah. I was always like a fan of horror comics and stuff. Which Hor- comics were you into? Um, a thing called Scream. Right. I don't. It was a UK based thing. A lot of little horror sort of stories, black and white. It was sort of printed on like a toilet roll paper sort of stuff. You know, it was crazy. Low-grade. I actually went. I had left them in the attic and came back to him about three years later and they were just it was almost dust you know oh I mean? it just God. turned to dust which sort of adds to the mystery of it you know yeah it was brilliant really good really creepy eerie sort of stories you know and that's sort of connected yeah you know i've, I've always been into kind of really sort of dis well not i don't know whether you would call it disturbing something that sort of really catches you yeah like real horror that that you can relate to i think that's that's actually the the thing you know relating to the stuff and it, i don't know the american sort of based comics i wasn't really awfully into those i just didn't i just didn't connect with them no i think i think when i was uh, this is going back pre star wars so it's like 1976 yeah, i think yeah. i think me and my older brother got into a comic about dracula and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he got banned after a few issues because kids mm. kids were fucking scared to death of this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. You, you even got like a cut out Dracula mask that you, <laughs> you ran around the bedroom in and like <laughs> scared, scared each other to death. And then um, I guess I was at school, um, uh-huh. Star Wars comic came out. Yeah, yeah. And it was before the actual um, movies yes. came out. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, I was just informed recently that there's a guy going back and colouring the original Star Wars comics. Yeah. What's his name? Fucking Christopher Sotomayor. Mm-hmm. Do, do mm-hmm. you know him? I don't know him, no. no this, but... And this is what I mean. is I've, I've opened a can of worms in like knowing all these people because he's mm-hmm. actually brilliant. The stuff yeah, he's worked Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I have heard that 2000 AD has around about 200 artists on the books. You wouldn't want to know how many there is in, in America working for all the American companies and stuff. Yeah. There's so many people. Because it's all freelance work, um, there's just so many people working for these in this industry. It's just crazy. And it, when you go into the coloring, I don't know, you wouldn't be able to keep track of it. It's just too big. So are, are you guys kind of new to it? I mean, you've been obviously working with Bisley and Glenn for a while. I've actually I've been, I, I sort of worked it out. I've been working maybe for about seven years. So you're not new to it. <laughs> uh, it's it's one of those sort of things, you know, like overnight successes. You know, there's our 10 years in the making sort of idea. And sometimes when you just sort of pop in, you know, into anybody's view or whatever, there's a lot of sort of time in the background that people haven't really sort of noticed or whatever. And I've been doing a lot of different jobs like lettering and coloring and, you know, moving along from that point on to digitally painting my own covers and various things. When you're a colorist, I don't think very many people notice. It's sort of one of those things that it's like even in the titles or whatever, people don't go past like the penciler, really. Yeah, well, I think when I was doing the graphic design when I was young, I was encouraged by the record company to actually credit myself on the work I was doing because it was quite a lot of work to do the graphics. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. I basically got a a pencil sketch on paper from a band um, through the mail. 
uh, like a letter that was just like yeah. stick drawings, and <laughs> and then and then you got the slide from the artist, and then you basically made the cover as it mm -hmm. is in the shops. But it was quite a lot of work. But you went, a lot, you did a lot of it uncredited because people just thought that's what happens, right? You yeah, just, yeah. You just put a record out and it just appears in a yeah. shop. Yeah. There was fucking tons of work to be done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, get the logo right and the coloring mm -hmm. right and the text and the fonts and the fucking mm -hmm. photographs and all this shit. And I, I didn't get credit on every record I did. And some have actually been removed from um, from. Oh, okay. I guess okay. I wasn't. I guess I wasn't cool enough anymore. <laughs> when I joined Cradle of Filth, um, yeah. yeah, you lose a little bit of credibility, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> and um, say, you know, didn't want to say. It, it's kind of weird that it sort of goes around in circles. Like you know, you get you get yeah. too big and you fucking become mm -hmm. incredible, but you're also successful. So it it goes yeah. around. And yeah. you've you've just done your first 2080 cover. Did you do the graphics for that too, or did someone else do that? Um, somebody else did it. Are you happy what, with it? Happy with the result? Yeah. Um, what I usually do is when I'm doing a cover, I take a look at one of the covers already produced and I take all the sort of text off it and put it onto the cover that I'm producing so that I can see what it's going to look like. Because it's all the text and everything else is adding to the actual image. I always so thought it, so. As, as a graphic designer, you, know, you had to use that as part of the image. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I started off in graphic design, so... I produced a lot of logos and various things. My two brothers and I actually started a comic company, Berserker Comics, oh. and we, we produced some comics with Simon Bisley and Glenn Fabry and Alan Grant and a few other people. I would actually design a lot of the logos for that and do all the layouts of the covers and sort of the lettering for all that stuff as well. So it was kind of, you know, it was a bit of a learning curve, all that. It was just a process, really, of like you know moving from that to the next stage. And your first 2080 cover, which obviously just came mm -hmm. out like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. For me, was a bit of a revelation because I've not bought 2000 mm -hmm. AD since maybe 90, 1991 mm -hmm. or something. And that's when Simon Bisley's career was just sort of he was breaking. I don't know whether he was breaking away from comics as such. He was getting mm -hmm. into his own style, and he was doing mm -hmm. a lot of. Um, maybe record covers for bands that I liked. Yeah. So I was like very into, you know, Simon's work. It was like, wow, mm -hmm. he's, he's kind of mm -hmm. going on this journey that we can all follow now. Of course. And um, I, I kind of took a break from comics. And mm -hmm. then obviously when I sort of got to know you on uh, on the internet and yeah. sort yeah. of, uh, and that was nice because that's why I thought you were a little bit younger than you are. Yeah. <laughs> be because you responded so fast to everything I, I was doing. Yeah, um, yeah. Most of these people I'm working with, uh, you might not hear from three or four weeks. Yeah. yeah and then it would just like two that. words, like yeah. "sure, man," and it's like <laughs> Dude, it's got to be a little bit more specific than just that, because yeah, you know, yeah, we're yeah. trying to confirm a time to talk and everything. It's very yeah. difficult to pin people down. Oh, of course. Um, but them guys are kind of mm. like fifty and upwards. Mm, yeah, they're in the the next bracket, you and know. The, yeah, when you're in the next bracket, you kind of, I'm not going to name names, but <laughs> some people, you know, some people have problems turning computers on and stuff. I, 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 <laughs> can, na I can name people. My parents, for yeah. a start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking yeah. useless. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know. You know, I said to my mum, like, I'll send you a message on my phone, uh, on your mobile, uh -huh. to let you know I'm okay. You just have to read it, and you don't have to pick it up or anything and answer it. Yeah, She's yeah. like, oh, my phone's uh, in the kitchen drawer. It's run out of battery, like, three, <laughs> three months ago. And I was like, oh, so I guess I won't bother texting you then. You know, it was just yeah. like this complete storm wall with yeah, technology. Yeah. Remember, I mean, it's not that long ago mobile phones came out, really. You know, that generation was used to that and didn't need all the communication was all quite straightforward for them you know and they're not missing anything you no. know in their eyes uh, i got i got the father like a mobile phone like a an iphone there and um and before that he was said oh no i don't really need a mobile phone you know or like an iphone or anything complicated just a very basic phone would do and now he's never off it yeah you know what i mean so once you once you see what you're actually what you're missing you know you're you're hooked it's like a drug sort of thing so well i guess it was for like that w with us because when we were young like maybe 10 12 we got an atari yeah uh, which was technically half made of wood uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and um you know and we've seen it grow from then and we've become like yeah. we i guess we're weaned on it to, mm -hmm. to where we mm -hmm. are now and i guess mm -hmm. anybody who's born under a certain time now, like 2000 yeah. or something, they're born into like the world where yeah. the internet's been around for 15 years, and mm -hmm. it must mm -hmm. be strange. I, I guess they've not realised how strange it is. Maybe they'll have to get to our age to sit back and think, what would the world be like without all shit? I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, I'd like to think one it's... day they'll realise that they're totally reliant on it, and if you switch it off, they're all going to be fucked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was, I was sort of thinking about that because 
I was thought, thinking about Facebook, you know, and I, I thought to myself, it it's so strange how it sort of worms its way into your life. You, you don't sort of, you think to yourself, it's like coffee or something, you know, and then you notice your, your left hand, you know, your phone's in your left hand and you're, you're on Facebook, you know, you never even, it's, it's just automatic. It's just, it just goes without you even thinking. And um, yeah, if they killed it off, like you'd be in real trouble. Well, real so the, trouble. this is how much trouble you might be in, because I, mm. I, I did a little bit of maths. Yeah. Just to sort of realize what kind of a gaping hole we're staring at. Yeah. So on average, anybody could be on Facebook for five hours a day, mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. and off, on and off, from waking up to checking your messages, yeah. to sneaking okay. in, you know, checking in on your dinner hour and then at work and yeah, yeah, yeah. wherever, and then in, in the pub at night. Okay. Five, so that we'll round it off at five hours a day. Jesus. So <laughs> over a week, yeah, that's thirty-five hours a week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So over a month, that was like holy shit. Yeah, it starts building up over a year. It was something like seventy-two days of your life is on holy Facebook. Holy shit. And it's like, yeah. if your boss said you've got 72 days of holiday this year, you'd be like over the fucking moon. But yeah, if you had that, se- 72 just... days on the internet, you'd be like, oh, really? And I'm, wind- I'm wrong, Ryan, I'm, I'm winding it down here to five hours. Some people on it for fucking <laughs> 10 hours a day. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It. I would maybe say, hey, I was winding it down. Yeah, I need to know cat. what someone's that... having for dinner. That's exactly. <laughs> it's so funny as well, because it's like, you know, the cat things and stuff. It's like you... See the amount of cat pictures and cat videos and stuff there's on on Facebook. It's just insane. I guess it's all in good humour, but imagine if cats yeah. could actually uh, enable yeah. themselves to sign off on this and just say, you know what, fuck you. <laughs> We're not going to allow any cat pictures anymore. We want some money it. for this shit, right? And That's it. Yeah, yeah. They'd be just like tumbleweed blowing around on Facebook, <laughs> like nothing to talk about anymore. I don't know what else they would need to ban on Facebook, but there, there's the comments. What I love is the people that make the comments. They say, oh, what a really terrible blah, blah, blah. It's all sort of mystical, you know, so that you have to actually say to them. It's um, like the ambiguous comment. Yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. It's, you have to say to them, uh, what, what is it? What's wrong? Yeah, what exactly? Why yeah. are you going to kill yourself? Yeah, and then they basically <laughs> say, well, um, I can't really say. I can't really say on Facebook, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's just hilarious. I think it's like a cry for help without actually telling anybody what's that. wrong. So I guess you were you were at the right time for Star Wars coming out the first time. I yeah. was just born. So, oh right, um, well wow, right. So it was basically, you know, <laughs> they could have just shoved me in front of the T or not the TV, brought me into the cinema. Yeah, it was did close. See, it was very close. Did you see any of the originals on screen? I didn't. No. 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 It's uh, I saw ET, so it's kind of old enough, like, but just sort of just missed the just missed the Star it. Wars stuff, yeah. yeah. I, I think I was born at the I was born in seventy, so I, I was about eight years old when it came out. Oh really? Oh, yeah, okay. and my okay. parents were very like open minded to stuff like new things, and we we were four boys, so they were very yeah. interested in ent- entertaining us because we'd get bored quick. I'm, I'm sure. I don't <laughs> I don't, re- I don't recall. So I, I, I guess it was at the right time at the right place um, yeah, yeah. For, yeah. for that. I remember the Sex Pistols being on the radio. Oh, and they okay, got they okay. got banned a couple of times, and we had to listen to the cassette of the <laughs> like frigging in the rigging and like in the bedroom. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. don't let your parents hear the cassette of that because. The... Oh yes, yes. Which yes. we'd obviously recorded off the radio. I love cassettes and stuff. They were brilliant, really good. I remember actually, I had some band or whatever, and um, I had got like a bootleg version of the the cassette, and it had no cover or anything, and wow. I had like a, a Spectrum computer or something like that. I had to draw like the the cover on the computer on like a, with one of the original art packages. <laughs> I printed it all out on one of those dot matrix sort of printers, you know. And it's like it was just all these dots and makes so much noise when it's printing this thing out. It takes so long to print it out. <laughs> Whenever it comes out, it looks like shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you're all impressed and all. You know, you're like, holy crap, this is amazing. I guess looking at the artwork that you've done for the cover of 2000D, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you must look at that now from your old cassette example mm. to, to mm-hmm. what detail and quality you can get now. I mean, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. To what scale was that cover? Well, you, you don't really work on scale as in like Painting. paper sizes and stuff. It's it's more like dots per inch, yeah. you know, DPI. And so I, I would work on like a 300 DPI and just sort of work on the, the actual size is going to be printed out. So yeah. I just sort of work it that way. 
Things, yeah, things have changed massively because of the way that, you know, the type of paper they're using now and the type of printers and the quality you can actually get on paper. Like years ago, you wouldn't have been able to produce that. That's why it was a lot of line art and flat coloring and stuff. And, you know, now you can basically produce whatever you want, even charcoal stuff, anything at all. And, and printers all reproduce the, you know, it to a really good quality. The, the shocking element for me was when I left 2000 AD, I think Bisley was... Mm-hmm. It just done slain in colour, and yeah. then then there was this like fifteen twenty year gap, and I came back and I thought, what was it ABC Warriors? Yeah, yeah, yeah by yeah. by Clint Langley, and it was like mm-hmm. it was like fucking three D. Oh my god, it was like mind blowing yeah. the difference. Yeah. It was like I don't know where I'd been that whole time. Yeah, when Simon yeah when St- Simon started the stuff in colour. Um, I remember speaking to him before about it, and I think the the slain was his first painted work. Yeah, I think for a uh, comic that was quite new. Yeah, and he was he was doing a page a day, as far as I know. And he was he said he was learning the process through actual doing the graphic novel, just and on, just on the fly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But there's very few people can actually do that. That's uh, it takes a certain you know. I think in art there are two different people. You've got the people that really, really overthink things, and sometimes that can stop your experimentation. You know, you stick almost to what what you're comfortable with. And then there's the people that really sort of put themselves out on a limb and, and just almost go for it. I think Simon's one of those people, you know, that that has he's experimented and he seems to always come up right. It's strange. It's strange stuff. But he definitely had changed the, the whole thing, the whole process. He had, you know, he had made a massive sort of statement with that. Everybody was trying to copy him and. And the editors were actually asking people to copy him. You know, could you do it in the style of Simon Bisley? And, I, do, um, I do remember his ABC Warriors. Just the black and white line art before he yeah. did Slain was mind-blowing. Yeah. I, I was a teenager and I was just thinking, this is mm-hmm. the best thing I've ever seen in my life. I couldn't believe yeah. someone had yeah. done it in pen yep. and ink. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. There's a lot of... Uh, it's very dynamic. And as I always say, the art that really works is the stuff that you can really relate to and it, it draws you in you know there's there's something that you can relate to and in in simon's work it's sometimes the poses the poses look very natural and um some of the abc warrior stuff the joe pineapple like one of the poses that he does and that like a very kind of iconic pose you know with his hand like draped over the the rifle that's over over his shoulder it looks relaxed it doesn't look stiff there's a lot of artists that would produce like a, an image like that and, and would go a different direction on it. But he sort of he likes to put in a lot of relaxedness and relaxed limbs and, you know, people that are they're not really doing anything. It's a balance between action and non action. It's important to know how to put those balances in to be able to to make a, a statement. So yeah, he know he knows when to when to put it in and when not. I think the first time I saw what ended up as the your first 2000 AD mm-hmm. cover. The first time I saw that artwork on Facebook, yeah, I actually thought it was um, a clip from the movie. Oh, okay. okay. And obviously, you you know, you click on it, and it becomes enlarged, and you're thinking, wow, that's actually yeah. a painting. So it's not it's yeah. not a clip from the movie. So it's virtually mm-hmm. realistic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on a on a thumbnail scale. Yeah. Um. So how do you, I mean? I'm not going to get into the how do you paint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 step by step because yeah. it is, I know it's very intricate but y- your style is very realistic based I mean the, I thought the yeah. Judge Death one was uh, probably one of the best I've ever seen of Judge Death okay. I think it's it's your direction isn't it it's the kind of the direction you, you're pushing yourself and um, I almost want to turn things into real life because I want to see what they look like myself you know I want to see what Judge Death looks like in real life and I don't I don't like to reproduce all the same sort of poses that everybody else has has produced trying to come at it at a slightly different angle i think if you're ex- an extreme fan of things sometimes you are at a slight disadvantage because you already have in your mind all these ideas that are coming from that sort of world yeah you're you expecting some, it yeah yeah and it's like judge dread everybody will seems to base well not everybody but a lot of people seem to base judge dread on um clint eastwood Blade Runner and things like that, you know, you can see the the poses are all coming from that, and you know the Dirty Harry sort of covers and things, and it, they are good, and uh, you know you don't want to stray too far away from the original sort of idea, or it'll 
it's not really Judge Dredd anymore. So there's a balance. There's there's somewhere in there. You, you know, you want to be in in the sort of creative section of that. That's a wee bit different. Yeah. And I I like to go in there really. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. When I was doing the Judge Death, I had this idea of of him being kind of unhinged and it like almost not sort of with his arms out attacking or going to you know going for you like the you new know, Bell Lugosi sort of pose yeah. or whatever um which is obvious what he's going to do there you know he's pointing towards you with his hands and he's coming after you yeah i sort of wanted something where he was standing there and he looked you were looking at him and he you know what is he doing he looks really kind of he's covering his face and he's all almost disturbed sort of in a way it has to be almost terrifying because he, it's judge death and a lot of this the comic strips of the, the deaths in there, there's a lot of times that he's sort of almost humorous it's sort of it's not that's not the way i see it really and you know my idea would be it, it has to be almost terrifying to me it looked like he was going through a bout of madness yeah so yeah. like realizing yeah. his own position in the world where he was just yeah. completely fucked up <laughs> yeah 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 that's the idea and it, it's also the the moment before he does something you know the moment before he dives out and attacks you or whatever and i i sort of like that because the moment before it happens is anticipation and it's the unknown if you you know the unknowns what everybody's afraid of really I think that's what Pat Mills was trying to explain when I was asking him about if he'd seen the new Judge Dredd film. Yeah. And he said it was very stiff in parts and they missed a lot mm-hmm. of the humour that the original comic had. Yeah. Of his yeah. character, which sort of you just backed up in the fact that these are multifaceted sort of characters that a lot of, of people just think, oh, he's just like a tough guy like Dirty Harry. And he mm-hmm. just, he just mm-hmm. sh- shoots anybody on will. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not really that shallow. It's it's a lot more to it than that. It's good that you yeah. know, yourself... He's trying to expand on a character like Dridge Death. He just think just touches people and they die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you might have a sense of yeah. humor about it too, you know. Yeah, of course. The thing about it is when you look at things like um, the Game of Thrones or, or stuff like that, you know, the new age of storytelling, it's very hard to tell who the bad is, who the good is. It's not black and white anymore. You, yes. you have to you have to use your brain and sort of try and work things out. And you have to all, sometimes you like the body, sometimes you like them, you know, and you shouldn't. And that's just, that's what life is. And it's all complicated and confusing. And that's what it should be in the art as well. It yeah. should be confused in a way because we, we're past that point. We're past the point where things have to be polarized and, you know, the bad guy is standing there with an evil grin and, you know, the good guys looking all tough and sort of strong and macho sort of thing. We're 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 gone. That's that's over, really. I mean, it's still it's still around. You can use it if you want, but I think we have got to the point where, you know, you need something more in there. You have to sort of get out of those little areas, really. I agree. I think uh, good and bad is just a point of view, depending on whose side you're on. Of course. <laughs> extremely. Yeah, extremely. Yeah. And I've always it. sometimes batted for the wrong side. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I always yeah. thought Darth Vader was way cooler than Luke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? That kind of, that, yeah. on, on a humorous level. Yeah, but totally. you, you know what I mean? I, I loved uh, Dirty Harry as a kid. He had a bit of an influence mm. on me growing yeah. up. And yeah. I, I never owned a, a massive gun. Uh, yeah. Luckily. <laughs> 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 do, do you think you're going to go on to like, Obviously, from the cover, the next mm. step would be to actually go into the magazine and do a strip. Yeah, is, is that I'm, on the cards? Yeah, I'm sort of. I'm working on something at the minute, a four-page thing. Oh, good, um, good. Can't really say much about it, really. Um, Just tell me, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it is. It is a lot of work. Yeah, it's it's only four pages, but it's a lot of work. I'm doing it the same quality and same amount of detail as the covers and there's only really about five panels per page but i want to try and pack as much as possible in without destroying the actual story i have to say it's kind of i don't know per page i don't know i wouldn't even want to think it really depends but it's at the minute it's like a process i'm really trying to figure out the sort of the storytelling process for interior work and stuff so are you writing it no um because that's an interesting thing. It's like, uh, as a layperson to how the things are done, and people sometimes ask me this about music. It's like, yeah, you know, who goes first, the drummer or the singer or the keyboard yeah. player? Who who actually starts the process? And yeah. I guess it, it's difficult to sort of 
imagine a, someone who got an idea and writes it the, you, you get it on paper and you have to I guess you might imagination fills yeah. it out and then they go no that's wrong yeah, yeah of, course, of course and it goes back yeah. and forth a little bit and then the, the you know the lettering guy comes in and then finally the graphic designer and then it's printed yeah it's, it's a big process to the whole thing that we see on the shelf extremely yeah extremely. Um, and what goes on behind closed doors people are very interested in these days whether they can grasp the amount of work that goes into it. Even, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. a record would take maybe, even if you did a fast album, it would take a year yeah. um, from yeah, yeah, yeah. from concept to actually having it on the shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that Judge Dredd cover maybe took me about, about two days. I would say if I went back maybe about two years ago or something around that, it would have took me about a week. And it, it's because I'm working on interior pages as well with... Simon Bisley, um, actually, you know, digitally painting over his uh, pencil work, and originally that would take me a day to do a page, and I'm sort of on about ten pages a day now. So it's kind of progressed. I think uh, we've we've did it at least a thousand pages now, or I would say maybe even more. And um, it's it's just one of those things, you know. You you go through the process. It's really stressful. You do a lot of hours, maybe about 15 hours a day working at a computer. And then after maybe about a year, things just sort of, something relaxes in your brain and you think less about it and it just becomes a wee bit easier and faster and the speed just, it develops naturally. I think Dave McKean explained it as he wasn't doing art, he was doing mm. work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it became yeah, like, yeah. A, a, you know, he became like a worker, not an artist. Yeah. Um, yeah so yeah. How, 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 would you, how would you define yourself? As like a digital artist or a, a painter? Yeah. Or? I would say a digital painter. I saw you having like um, a little sort of chat mm. on Facebook about someone accusing you of doing a yeah something that wasn't exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, the problem with it is there's still like a stigma with digital art people sort of think that you know you're sticking a photograph on and painting over the photograph or you press some buttons or whatever and it just sort of appears or even at a lesser extent photoshop does a lot of the work for you yeah it's just like a filter you, know, you can add it's a complicated subject but generally photoshop there's advantages of photoshop you know you can go back if you've made a mistake you can you know undo it um you can move things around if you want to move an arm or or whatever but in traditional pencil stuff you can move an arm as well it'll just take you a bit longer you know so i think a lot of it is to do with time it yeah. saves you a lot of time really because there's a lot of stuff on photoshop it depends how far you go with it when i use photoshop i basically paint I just use a, a, a brush and, and just paint. I don't use any of the, the effects, um, any of the filters or any of that type of stuff because I want to try and keep it. I want to put that bit of pressure on myself and keep it as close to traditional as you can get, really. You know, So when you're doing it that way, well, my idea is that you can, you can transfer, hopefully, a lot of the skills on to you know, traditional painting. Maybe uh, from an artist's point of view, Mm. where people might get confused yeah because you're saying you're a painter mm -hmm. and then you look at the artwork and it's so good people would think that's not real that's that's a yeah. tr trick of the eye like deception yes, i'm yes, being yes, deceived yes. here so obviously yeah. he's cheating yeah. he's not that yeah. good yeah. yeah for me it was different i just thought mm -hmm. fucking hell this guy's talented <laughs> <laughs> okay no i did you know what i mean yeah. it was like i could tell yeah. the difference between cheating and real but it yeah. was just ultra yeah. good the thing about it is it's strange because some people will say i'm not into digital art it's too plasticky for yeah. my liking but the funny thing about it is there's certain people that paint and when you look at their their paintings it looks smooth as well what what they're talking about is the smoothness of it so really, I mean, that, that's nothing to do with computers. That's just a style of painting. And the thing about it is, you, you know, I've seen a lot of realistic painters traditionally painting with paint on board. And, it, you know, you wouldn't know whether it was computer generated, sort of digitally painted or traditionally painted. You yeah. wouldn't know. You know, if you took a photograph of it, you wouldn't know. They're just very good. Yeah, yeah. I think when I was a big fan of Geiger when I was young, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and obviously had a big influence on my tastes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I realised maybe when I was about ten, I got um, Geiger's Alien, uh -huh. and there was I think there was a picture of him in there where he was I think the board he was working on was maybe three times bigger than him. Uh, yeah. So, so that was very surprising. Yeah. And then he was using a, a rather big industrial airbrush. 
Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't realize at the time that that was a tool you could use to make it look, like you're saying, shading and all that. It, it's of like, course. So he wasn't painting. He was actually, in my mind, he was not cheating, yeah. but he was introducing a different technique yeah. that could yeah. be considered to be cheating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's exactly it. You know, you go back in time and the people that mixed their own paints thought that the people that bought paint in tubes P were cheating. Purist. Yeah, exactly. Do you know? It's a good comparison. Uh, people that, that painted in acrylic, you know, people that thought, or people that traditionally painted in oil thought yeah. that the, the acrylic painters were cheating. Well, that's right, and, yeah, because oil is fucking terrible to work with. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what I mean? And it's 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 went on and it's went on and on. And I do understand with computers, there is an element of you can actually, well, you can deceive people with it. You could put a paint on and squiggle over it a bit and it would, you know, you could sort of, you could maybe fool a lot of people, you know, so th there is that. People don't like being fooled and I think that's maybe a part of the problem with it. The other problem is that people actually, and the same with me, I like to look at a piece of uh, an actual painting and I like to look at the strokes on it. I like to see it right in front of my face and touch the, the paint on it, you know. Yeah, the, the original, yeah. There's a thing about that as well, really, but but there's things changing now. I would do a lot of commissions now for people, and they're they're all digital. I never even offered that before because I, I didn't think people would want to pay money for um, something that's a, a digital medium. Obviously, you came from a graphic design background, and we can compare that maybe to even using Letraset as opposed to Led Leddy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, which was a real skill that has mm -hmm. died because of I, rem I remember at college there was a, an old guy there who, who was on the top floor and he had a big old uh, sort of ink printer. Yeah, and he yeah. show he used to show classes on how to do leading, which is basically writing mm -hmm. um, a page of text backwards. Yeah, with yeah. all the right spacing yeah. of each letter and the fonts mm -hmm. and the italics, and you really learn mm -hmm. what fucking lettering meant. It was serious, oh, yeah. Yeah, serious yeah. business. So mm -hmm. you must have considered letter set, and then later mm -hmm. printing out your own text as cheating. Oh yes, <laughs> of course, of course. But that is it, isn't it? Do you know what it is? There, there's a thing about diminishing skills. I think it is. You know, every generation seems to there. There's a lot of skills dying off, and. I remember originally when I was I was working for a company, I, I had to do a lot of technical drawings for actually producing pieces of machinery and things. And you would have to actually figure out, you know, a curve. You'd need to make do a mathematical equation to figure yeah, out the yeah. actual curves and things. And it was all by hand. It was the time period when computers were starting to move in. The company didn't want to spend any money on computers, so everybody was doing it still by hand. Oh we God. were raging because we thought, oh, these computers are going to come in and just, you know, make it really easy for us and whatever. But I must have, in the time I was working for them maybe for a year, and I maybe did about 2,000 drawings for them. And now, you know, that that's a skill that's gone. You know, there's yeah. very few people that are actually producing technical drawings actually by hand and it is a pity and it, de it definitely is a pity and there's a place for it all there's certain advantages to digital painting that there isn't in traditional painting in the way that when you produce a piece of art digitally you sort of know what way it's going to look on a screen you, you've got a better idea on the way it's going to look when it's going to be printed yeah because sometimes when you actually you scan a traditional piece or like an acrylic painting or, or something like that or pencils or whatever, sometimes it reflects. And in the scans, you get these reflections. So the, so the image doesn't actually turn out the way you wanted it to turn out, you know. So it needs altered and things. Where if you're working on, on computer, it comes out the way you want it to come out. I'm, try, I'm trying to think my mind back now to who, who would have thought... Um the guy doing leading was cheating it was probably yeah. some sort of guy who was etching yeah. like a monk 12th century like etching that's, and putting a layer of ink on it and then pressing it in a book that's exactly it yeah and then the, the leading, you, leading yeah. guy comes along and goes hey, i can do this quicker than you <laughs> that's and, it. and the monk yeah. says you're a cheating bastard yeah, yeah. but that's the way it's the way it goes and the thing is it's kind of strange because we are all th those techniques are all I'll not say evolving, but progressing. They're progressing to a point where we're not going to have that many skills left because we've got all these computers and we've got all these machines. And yeah, there's a machine for everything now. So you, you know could actually, I mean? you could just maybe generate your own comic by pressing in Judge Dredd. Yeah. Uh, the style of artists like Ryan Brown and Bisley 
mashed yeah. up. You just put it yeah. in a little fucking machine, and it yeah. comes out as a comic in that style. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. <laughs> like a font. I, yeah, you can see you can see something like that happen in the future. Technology moving on so far that it's going to be at that point. I said right? you'd type it in. You wouldn't even do that. You just think it. You just think, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, the, that's totally true. Yeah. And the yeah. replicator, like a three D yeah. printer, would just make you comic of your own thing. You could have yeah. uh, any subject matter, like porn or fucking <laughs> war or whatever you want, as gross as you want. <laughs> you write your own stories, so yeah. you got you guys would be totally out of jobs because kids would just be writing their own stories now. I know, I know, but I hope it's going to be a long time. You know, I, so. I, I never thought that. You know, like when you you see uh, you get a credit for the person that does the lettering in in the comic. Yeah, and that's a definite style. But mm-hmm. is that not like a typeface now, where somebody can just type it, is, it out? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how come lettering people have still got jobs? Well, there's there is the skill of where to put the actual bubbles and mm. things like that. You know how to how to lay it all out on the page because positioning. Yeah. It, yeah, it has to. I mean, the position of the stuff has to be worked in such a way that it's not covering things and it it's moving like fluidly moving. I mean, you still need a person to to do that. It is it is a skill. I would say it's probably, well, it's not as hard as it was when people were doing it by hand. I mean, I remember looking at the stuff. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but I was looking at the Judgment in Gotham. I was looking at the letter in, in there, and it was all done by hand. And you could see, like, I mean, there was a lot of skill in that. Like, I tried imitating the stuff by using computer. You know, I produced, like, a font and produced all this uh, these bubbles that didn't look like they were produced digitally. So I wanted that sort of hand-produced feel to the thing. But I wasn't going to invest that amount of skill to, to learn how to... I knew that lettering was only a stepping point for me. You know, it was I was basically doing it because people needed this job done at the time. So, yeah. you know, I was only stepping into those shoes, really, at that point. I think when I did my work experience with Kevin mm-hmm. Walker, I was de- there for two weeks. Mm-hmm. And he was inking Rogue Trooper. Yeah. One of the first strips he did. I remember the the bubbles were already on the pages with mm-hmm. the penciled in. I don't know who'd done the lettering, but it was penciled in. He had to ink that, I think, as well. So it was, yeah, I yeah. think he, he managed to churn out a page a day. Yeah. The thing about it is, these days everything seems to be moving faster and faster. Pages have to be done faster. Comics are coming out quicker. It's it, everything's sort of rushing and rushing. In everybody's life, generally things are just progressing so fast and. Comics are exactly the same. And it's unfortunate because a lot of the time people can't put the detail or the effort that they want to put in to a project. It turns into a job for a lot of people. I don't really want to get to the point where I just think of it as a job, you know, because I I feel that I'm trying to sort of up my skill and better myself, um, learn something all the time, you know, try and progress further, um, do a better job than the last one, really. If it turns to the point where it's it's a job, then be a bit disappointing, really. Yeah, what what are you gonna do? I don't know. Because I, <laughs> I never I never considered that I'd be a chef. Yeah. Which yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people say you shouldn't tell people because it kind of blows the mystery. But there's I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm from Yorkshire, mate. There is no fucking mystery. <laughs> <laughs> it's real in Yorkshire. <laughs> but I I felt like when you know when I was obviously in your peak of your musician lifestyle, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. it did become like an office job. He was just traveling yeah. a lot, and it, you know there was, there was a routine to everything. Getting ready yeah. on, for yeah. the stage, and mm-hmm. you know the set list is an hour and a half. And you, mm-hmm. you come off mm-hmm. and you get as drunk as you want and blah blah. Yeah. blah. It yeah. became after twenty years, it became a routine, like an office job. It became yeah. a, little, a little bit boring, and um, I never thought I'd have the confidence to break away from it. You just, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of older musicians just do it because they're just scared they can't do anything else. Well, um, I mean, twenty years is is a long time to do anything. I think it was enough. Yeah, we could even argue that I maybe did it five years too long. Right, okay. mm. <laughs> but it was easy money, and you just had to sh- switch off any feelings and just. Of course, of course. Like a turd just flowed down the road. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe you were doing the same thing over and over or maybe you didn't have enough space to kind of learn new things in that environment. But I, I sort of feel that I have only really started, you know, on a, on a bit of a journey, on an arty type journey. There's a, an awful lot to learn. So yeah. I don't feel it's sort of it's strange because you're, it's a bit depressing because you think to yourself, holy shit, 
have so much to learn but then it's always good because you have a lot to learn as well so it's kind of a double-edged sword sort of idea that was the challenge for me as at 43 becoming a chef yeah. was a real a real big step because i was having to learn mm -hmm. and i had to do exams and qualify and all that as well i, I was yeah I, I considered myself to be a bit of a thicko mm, okay um, <laughs> Well, especially when it comes to talking to people on the podcast, because yeah. you, you do a bit of research into some people and you feel terribly out of your depth mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. uh, maybe engaging certain people. Um, I'm a lay person in many terms on a lot of things. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's it, it's kind of a good thing that I can admit that a lot of people would never do that. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, I've always believed that the first rule is there is no rules. Uh -huh, and course. once you've accepted that, life will become a lot simpler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, totally true. Totally you know, true. It's, it's a bit like chaos theory is, you know, yeah. once you realize there's no laws of, yeah. apart from the law of chaos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's it. You know what I mean? It's like you step out of the house and get run over by a bus, but if you'd have maybe waited yeah. two minutes, the bus would have gone by, you would have never got run over. Yeah. So you, there's yeah. that element of like a weird thing going yeah. on always around you yeah. that you can either join in or not it's up to you yeah that's exactly it i mean the, the, there's an awful lot of holding yourself back in general you know in life and i think that um we, and everybody does it and this the thing about it is you know what's good for you and what's best for us all is not to hold ourselves back it's just a thing that sort of it's ingrained in us and i think you know a lot of people lose that as they get a lot older maybe you get to about the age of 60 or something they start unwinding and kind of relaxing into life in general and um and they don't really care as much and that's when you can learn a lot more you, there's no barriers there's nothing holding you back really i think i did that when i was 20. <laughs> oh really <laughs> no okay. i'm joking <laughs> well stop giving no, a I shit done it yet. I'm, I'm still like I'm just wound up like a spring. <laughs> well, you, you sound very enthusiastic about it. Maybe um, I was a late starter in a lot of things, drinking yeah. and, and music and all that. I was a late starter, mm. so mm. I had a lot of enthusiasm even in my early 30s. But now it seems like 10 years of that, it seems to have waned a lot. And now I'm very happy and content already mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. position I'm in. Yeah, um, I yeah. think if it's, if it's an aspiration to have a Wikipedia page, I think that's yeah. uh, quite a sad yeah. thing. But... But I've got one, so who am I? <laughs> which which I find to be a rather weird. <laughs> yeah. I aspire. I aspire to a Wikipedia page. <laughs> well, the thing is, you're not allowed to do your own, are you? No, you're not. No, no. But I could do one for you. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, you're not, you're not allowed to change it. I think I got told uh, off once. for There was a fact on there that wasn't correct, yeah. like uh, where I was born. Ah, uh, okay. He okay. said I, he said I was born in a, a cemetery. What? <laughs> which, which, Were well, you? No, I wasn't. No, I was born like everybody else in a hospital. <laughs> but the story goes that Wikipedia accused me of writing my own page. Okay. Now, what what happened was the person who'd made the page just uh, copied and pasted it from a biography that was written uh, on, on cradleofilth dot com. Got you. So okay. technically, okay. I did write it. You uh -huh. write your own biography because the person who's like setting up the yeah. website doesn't know anything about you. Uh, ah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I wrote something like "Born in Heckman White Cemetery." Uh, you know, because we're like vampiric or whatever, oh, we're dead of evil. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a joke. Once yeah. that got on Wikipedia, people were like, oh my God, that's fucking nuts. <laughs> it's real. <laughs> yeah, so so I went on and changed it. And I, you know, somebody sent me a message saying, you know, like a moderator said, you're not allowed to change your own page. You, ha you have to get someone else to do it, which yeah, I thought was weird because yeah. I, I know the facts. I'm yeah, changing yeah, yeah, the facts yeah, to be yeah. more factual as opposed yeah. to just writing how fucking cool I was. God, that's weird. I don't see anybody doing that. But um, yeah. <laughs> so, so you don't have a Wikipedia page yet? I don't. I don't know. I haven't looked. <laughs> well, oh man, that's perfect because that's you what... Know what. I don't. I. I. I don't have time for anything. You don't All Google do yourself. <laughs> eat, sleep, drink, and work, and that's basically it. Not in those. None of those orders. But uh, it's generally work, 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 and work. You know, and it's just madness. Pure yeah. Madness. So it's picking up, I guess. For I would say for the last three years, I've I've just been steady, and it's and for the, sometimes it's went. A bit crazy you know where, the, where you're you're working maybe i don't know 16 hours a day or something like that for wow. a whole week every single day and you get out get away from your computer and your eyes are going all over the place and you get into your car and your your head's swirling and you know <laughs> i know it's terrible it's really terrible you're doing yeah. the same thing you're looking at a screen for maybe of course yeah yeah four yeah. or five yeah. hours at a time without actually looking sideways yeah. it, you know, I mean, t and time does go fast on computers, I've noticed. Yeah. Oh, it does, yeah. See, the, the thing about it is, I would say the first year 
I worked on a computer. I was working intense, looking at the screen, and my eyes were getting really bad. And I was uh, realized that what it was is I wasn't actually focusing on anything at any distance. It was just the muscles in your eyes weren't getting any exercise. So I, I put an iPad beside me. Uh, so now I put documentaries and various lectures or whatever on uh, while I'm working. So I can move my eye back and forwards from the iPad to the computer screen. And my eyes seem to be fine now. You know, it's it's you have to sort of work out this process of of working. You know, I've also found that it's kind of weird because a lot of these things that I, I'm doing, a lot of other artists do as well. Uh, one of the other things that I do is I put like documentaries on, but things that I don't really need to look at, but things that are not going to be really interesting or it's <laughs> going to take my attention. It has to be the right level of shit, uh, as, <laughs> as Glenn Fabry said, you know. It has to be the right level of shit so that it's not, if it's absolutely shit, then you're you're just, you're transfixed on it, you know, and you just can't, you know what I mean? You can't get any work done. And if it's too good, then you're not going to get any work done any either. So you have to get a balance. I go through different subjects and stuff, go through like religions, and I would go through history and loads of different subjects. So each week I would have like something else or whatever. So I don't know whether it's learning. You're sort of absorbing some things, you know. I always th- I always found it, yeah, is it learning or is it just padding your mind out to re- sort yeah. of regurgitate in the public yeah. how much shit you know? That's, that's <laughs> it. That's <laughs> true. But I, I, I kind of specialized in like World War Two, especially the mm-hmm. German side of it. And yep. Um, yep. I think it came from my dad's he used to collect uh, memorabilia when I was young, so I was always yeah. surrounded by like flags and mm-hmm. caps and mm-hmm. fucking daggers mm-hmm. and shit. Yeah. And um, I don't know. Some a German friend of mine said, "What is your in- like? What is the English's fascination with like the war?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I I think I said something really brash like, "Well, because we won." <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think it was that <laughs> that distasteful. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Well, it was like it, it, totally. You, you do realize that we are completely obsessed with it still. Oh, the, the nobody Second else is. Yeah, <laughs> extremely. The amount of documentaries to do with the Second World War. Um, it's massive, growing it's, all the time. Uh, yeah, it's kind of weird because there's a lot less on the First World War. I think it's maybe to do with the first like film footage or whatever. Maybe that's why it, the Second World War is such a big thing. It's all recorded, really. But it's it's totally changed our whole world. You know, the Second World War and the First World War. Uh, I read a lot of lot of things about the business side of it and mm-hmm. it's re- yeah. very very scary yeah. and, and you try and transpose that into like what's happening now and you think we've not got any clever we're still getting deceived and screwed yeah <laughs> into totally doing things totally true it's yeah. quite scary I mean, it's totally true it's if you look at all the propaganda that went on during the war i think just it has evolved it's, it's become a lot better now we haven't kept on track with it and we're still sort of being deceived by a lot of the stuff. What sort of interests me about it, again, it's it sort of goes back into what I'm interested in general, art and stuff. It's the kind of, how do you relate to things? And um, I've read a lot of books on the Second World War to do with the German side. What's interesting is the books give a less black and white version of the events. It's not good and bad anymore. It's It's almost confusing. Uh, it's and it's the way it really should be because on one side they don't think they're bad the other side you know they think the other side's bad back and forward sort of thing and that's just the thing it's how do you relate to it you know so i i like to get all the detail and the personal the what those people felt and the detail on the stuff so that you can really understand what it's all about the same as like medieval life and any any time in history really it's what you really come out with that is you understand that everybody is the same whether yeah, it was 2000 yeah. years ago everybody felt the same and thought the same way and wanted the same things and you know we haven't really changed at all i, I had to read a lot of stuff to actually understand that so the, the interesting point i i wanted to make was it's like reverse psychology yeah. Where I think it's around 1990 when the Soviet Union broke apart mm-hmm. and all their archives became open a couple of years after where researchers could go and take their point of view into now what's known as books. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Research is absorbed. So you, mm-hmm. you did get a less good and bad side. Cause yes. Obviously, the yeah. Russians were just as brutal as anyone. Of course. Of and course. they don't yeah. like that 
part of it, but it's, yeah. it's there um, in, yeah. in, in the archives. So you take that as a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I like to go back into the 50s and read the mm -hmm. books and the documentaries and the interviews from then yeah. because they were really black and white. And sometimes they're a little bit more honest about it because it is black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. can sort of say things that they wouldn't be able to get away with now because it's more open. Whereas That's back right. then it was like, yeah. oh, I, you know, I can be honest with this bit and no one's going to fucking do anything about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah so in right. reverse psychology, I actually like going back to the time mm -hmm. when it, people were actually <laughs> mm -hmm. more, more mm -hmm. straight jacketed. Yeah. In a way, it's, it's more honest. So it's, it's kind of weird. I, I should have studied history more when I was young. but Even in school, when they were going through like the First World War and things like that, I had no interest at all. And um, they went through uh, Rome and various cultures and Greece and whatever, and I had no interest. And now I have found myself over the last maybe four, five years, I've went through most cultures to try and understand a bit more about them and, and put more meat on the bones and and take it from a real kind of basic understanding to try and to be able to relate to them really because i find that you you can add that information to other areas of your life as well and you can see it's like people understand in the past they'll understand the, the future really because we're all moving in a cycle really people make the same mistakes and a thousand years ago they were making the same mistakes that we're making now so you can sort of understand human nature a wee bit better really the people's read a lot of stuff about first-hand accounts about the second world war it's just it's interesting because a lot of the stuff isn't the way uh, people don't react uh, the way that we are programmed to believe people react, you know, yeah. as in people scream or whatever when something terrible. I mean, people laugh whenever something really terrible happens. Sometimes you sometimes people uncontrollably laugh. There's these strange things that people do. You notice a, a thing that like a theme that runs through everything, you know, and, and that's what I sort of like about in the art as well. I like to kind of put things in there that they're not the stereotypical sort of black and white versions that we all look at all the time. You know, it's somebody that's freaked out or whatever is making a strange expression or or something like that, you know, something really natural. Well, I, th I think that's the interesting bit about working for 2000 Ideas. It's yeah. always w worked on a notion of like the absurd yeah, <laughs> and the course. disturbed yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. part of yeah. society, and that's that was the appeal when I was young. Yeah. Was uh, it wasn't yeah. just like Beano? <laughs> yeah, well, I think they're the only place that you can actually get away with all that type of stuff. Yeah, quite yeah. subversive, really, and very important to have that on the shelves in town. <laughs> extremely, yeah, extremely, yeah. Well, well, you can see the way all, a lot of the American comics are. I mean, I didn't really understand what the superheroes were there for. Yeah, yeah. Because there were kind yeah. of man-made man problems and some man's going to come along and fix it. It's like, oh, yeah. that's a bit fucking boring. It's a bit like when you have, like, Superman in every single uh, film. He has a different suit. You know, the, they need to upgrade it constantly. <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's they think that the public wants to see him now in a different suit because they're bored, you know, because they're bored and they're, they'll get uninterested by the thing or whatever. Do we actually really live in a society where people need something different constantly? So, just to end, mm. how do you feel like these new Star Wars films might come out? I don't know. I th <laughs> I'm sort of looking at it, and I think it's going to be good. I you hope, hope it's going to be good. Yeah, hope it's going to be good. Yeah, I wasn't, wasn't really happy with the last three. The problem with it is that when you sort of grow up with things, you know, like Star Wars, and then you watch something that's made fairly new, and it's maybe made for kids as well. Even though you were a kid then, I don't feel that the last three films were made for us. I think it's one of those things, again, that it was it's all about money, you know, and who's who's really going to go to the cinema? There's going to be an awful lot of kids who are going to want to see that. So let's start, let's aim it towards kids. I guess Disney's got its hands on it now, so that will be done well. Yeah, the thing about this is they've took into consideration the fact that there are so many people grew up with Star Wars, yeah. and I think that they have catered towards them this time. Whenever you see like the trailer, it, it looks more like a, the traditional thing, and that can only be a nod to, towards the old stuff, really. But they haven't just went a kiddie film sort of thing like the last three. I just, I just hope that they do it right. There's plenty of good films coming out there. There's Mad Max. That was a really good film. Um, really well done. Not seen uh, it just, yet. Yeah. Well, I'll not, I'll not tell you, but you'll die at the end. <laughs>
But, uh... <laughs> well, I might like it then. <laughs> there's not enough to me. There's not enough of them films, Ryan, where yeah, everybody true. fucking dies at the end. Because yeah. I think yeah. my dad used to do that as a kid. He always stopped yeah. the movie two minutes before the end, going, "It's an end- shit ending. I'm not watching it." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So just stop it. Yeah. Like, Dad, I want to see the great. end. And he's like, "Nah, it's shit. You don't need to see that." <laughs> <laughs> that is good. That is because good. they didn't die. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's another thing that I problem I have with things in general. You know, that is just not real life. Yeah. You know, I, I like real life and I, I like art to imitate real life. I like it to have imaginary kind of unbelievable things turned real. And I, I like it to be uh, something that you can relate to as well. It's it's the same old story, really. If you don't relate to the art, you're not going to get sucked into the thing. No. If you tell them the whole story, it's it's pointless. You know, it's you're not engaging the people. So art, it has to be clever. It has to be clever. It has to be engaging. It has to relate. Well, I think you do a good job of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just just to end on, I, I was very mm-hmm. cr- critical of uh, Star Wars. Yeah. Um, and people always think I'm just a downer because I've got a huge Star Wars vintage toy collection. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So people think I'm obsessed with it, but I'm not. Ah. I was fucking seven, man. <laughs> you know, I'm not seven anymore. I just didn't throw all that shit in the bin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but I noticed that, for example, the new trailer. If there's three elements to it, there's the visual, which you're obviously mm-hmm. watching, and then yeah. there's the, the music's um, not been finished. I, get, I think John Williams is obviously doing the score. Yeah, and that yeah. must be a huge task. So he's obviously mm-hmm. not using any of the new music on the trailer. So we're using the old yeah. shit, which people fucking love. Yes, yes so, yes. so you've got that connection straight away. One one thing people connect to is the music, and yeah, then Ben Ben Burt's original sounds are all being used as well. So they love that bit too. Yeah. So two of the three elements are good. Yes. And even if the third element, which is the visual, is only half as good, you've got two and a half out of three already. Yeah. So you you've, you're on a fucking winner, even if it's shit. Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> so totally. if yeah, John yeah. Williams writes a shit score and Ben Burt <laughs> Ben Burt just lo- does a lot of naff sounds, <laughs> uh, it it might get one and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'll go well. Uh, I'm not we'll see. Speak too soon, you know. But um, I'm going to bring you. I'm I'm going to leave that in the podcast so we can come back to it next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dude. It'll you, be short. It'll be like it was shit. <laughs> you just, just say it's going to be a six and a half out of ten. I would say so. Yeah, I just, I hope it's more. But me know. too. I want it to be fucking eleven out of ten. But, oh, definitely. You know, come definitely. on. It's one of those films. You've got like that Batman, Superman film, and to be honest, not interested. It's sort of. It's just. Uh, I saw the trailer for it. it. What happens is they bring another trailer, or another photograph, another something, another bit, another. You've seen all the bodies. You've seen all the everything's. You've seen. You know, by the time the film comes out, you've seen mm. most of the stuff. And they've just it's story just shit. <laughs> un, yeah, shit and uninteresting. They're they're chucking these films out at the minute, and they need something to change. Yeah. Now, the, as I was saying, the Mad Max film was very well done. The design of it, the atmosphere, the visual stuff, it was just you know everything. It all just worked so well. It just needs some time to go and see it. Um, I'm yeah. not a massive movie goer. I might go maybe yeah. two or three times a year. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay. You know, so I never committed to that movie card where you have to go twice a month because I, oh, be- no. I never believed there was two films a fucking year worth watching. So. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. So, uh, well, thanks for your time, mate. Uh, we've already no been talking for one hour and 20 minutes. Jesus. But Didn't think it was that interesting. <laughs> no, well, well, this is the thing is that I've, um, me, and, me and Doug were talking for over two hours. Holy shit. And me and Pat Mills were talking for nearly three days. God. <laughs> it's yeah, very easy yeah. when she started, you know, if we were in a pub and we were talking like this, we'd probably talk for like four hours. Oh, now, yeah, yeah, we'd go on, go on. Okay. Um, you can say anything dodgy and I'll send you the file and you can listen to it and say, please cut that out. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. But like yes. Doug Bradley uh, admitted to a bit where we were talking about the movie Squirrels, which was really bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then he he admitted to killing squirrels in, when he was young. He realised, I think, afterwards. Yeah, you know, yeah. really, you can't really say that now because people won't understand what you mean. They just think you. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of bad, isn't it? Like, yeah. So, so I left it in. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm wondering now why he's not posted the link on his Facebook page. Because he's got like 150,000 people on there. Holy shit. So if a lot of them listened to it and thought, oh my God, you know, we loved you before, but now you're... <laughs> Podcasts are about that. That's what people want to listen to them for. 
Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. just a standard interview where you know, where I'm, you know, you're trying to sell your book to me or you move. Oh, of course, of course. They no, want to hear no, some like no. truth in it and uh, yeah, know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's it's all bullshit. I hear all the fake crap. You I know. know, people are just sort of they're they've got an agenda or something. You yeah, know, of course know, they have. Yeah, away to you and yeah, that's uh, exactly it. Yeah, and I've, and I've been in a band that everybody hated, but we sold a lot of records, so I've done that. Yeah, <laughs> not, in, not interested in doing that anymore. And <laughs> that's it. I do, I do, I do think. Career. I do think the podcast could be a lot more popular than it is, but yeah. I'm, I'm kind of happy in this position where I'm at right now where it's not. Do you know what the thing is? It's kind of weird because whenever you're not looking to be popular or whatever, it just sort of, things happen and then you sort of go, it, it's almost like you go on a wee slide. You end up in a, in a point where, you know, loads of people know what you're doing or whatever. It's kind of, it's the same as that art, the art and stuff, you know. Yeah. I, I All I would... I'm my biggest critic, generally. I'm very, very critical of my own work. I never wanted to put anything out unless it was right. And I had to get over that point. I had to get over it because I still don't like most of the stuff that I produce. It's one of those things. You have to force yourself to to change, really, a bit. So I've been focused on that most of the time, you know, just trying to do as well as I can. But in the background, it sort of starts growing and growing and growing, which is really good, like... I'd like to thank Ryan Brown for being the most excellent of guests. There's now a new Facebook group of Life is a Hideous Thing where you can add to follow all the updates and future episodes. Thanks for listening.